good morning everyone thank you chair for this permission i would be speaking on the braille study which was the first ever evidence based may study which was done for this new molecule that is brolosizumab in our country and it was done definitely in this eastern part of our country so uh, this is a disclaimer in fact this is a sponsored talk well here they try to understand the short term efficacy and safety profile of in new vascular amd of this uh, particular molecule and what they noted was they had seen a significant improvement in visual as well as reduction in dikh nahi raha sir idhar ye mood nahi ho raha no no issues i have yeah so uh, the thing was it also saw a significant reduction in uh, central uh, thickness and the mean follow up this of this study was 7.3 uh, plus minus 2.2 week and there was no evidence of ioi and in fact it was 126 intravitreal total injections which were done in this case so i think i will ye dikh nahi raha yahan pe yahan pe nahi move ho raha nahi ho raha hai bhai theek hai main wahi dekh ke baat kar raha hu so what they uh, achieved was if you see the uh, i will go through that disclaimer yeah so short term efficacy was uh, assessed basically and they saw a significant reduction in visual acuity as well as reduction in uh, central uh, macular thickness and the purpose of this study was to report 52 weeks real world evidence and safety outcomes of brolosizumab therapy for uh, neovascular amd in indian eyes so this was the design of the study where they were given into two groups that is braille 1 and braille 2 the demography if you see the characteristics were well matched and if you can see the overall reduction in the visual acuity gain you can see a significant reduction where uh, significant improvement in the vision and if you look at the switch group which was done in a resistant it was the you could see a log mark gain of 0.6 0.2 again and if you look at the central macular thickness again the th it achieved significant if you see the p value it was significant reduction in the central macular thickness be it in a naive group or a switch group and this trend of central mac maintaining the lowered macular thickness uh, was maintained over a period of 52 weeks if you look at which type of a fluid responded to reduction in uh, means reduction you will see overall reduction of beat srf beat intraretinal fluid or pd there was significant reduction statistically significant reduction in the fluid characteristics and this fluid characteristics have been uh, put over this uh, particular table and when they did a sub subgroup analysis of the cases which responded to fluid reduction means if you can see in a treatment naive gray again it achieved a statistical significance of 0.001 and even in switch therapy group you can see a statistically significant more significant reduction in the fluid was seen in intraretinal fluid and srf pd also showed significant reduction but more so on in, in cases of switch therapy and if you look at the durability of that study what a molecule on an average it was claimed to be having a effect for about 8 to 12 weeks in almost 70% in the western literature in a hocken uh, harrier trial here we see that the braille short term study showed 10.2 and in braille 52 that is one year complete follow up it showed almost 11.73 weeks means 12 weeks and the mean number of injections was 4.8 in treatment naive eyes received mean 4.35 and in switch therapy it received 4.94 and these are some of the representative cases i will show share if you come to the most important thing which uh, people are skeptical of using this is ioi and in this particular study they have noted none of the cases which had ioi and uh, uh, sorry three cases of ioi was noted and it was usually seen after fifth or sixth injection of brolosizumab and it was seen more so in patient who had recalcitrant the indication was recalcitrant new vascular amd and all these three eyes recovered completely to conservative management in the form of topical steroids and oral steroids so uh, if you see the um, overall encouraging results in fact the fear of ioi can be um, means significantly we are, we are comfortably saying that we do not get inflammation even in my study my uh, i have not done it put it together i will share some of the cases from my own particular uh, um, clinic 
So this is a case of a resistant uh, CN um, a PED, I should say. This is a 45 years old female who had decreased vision of three days duration, and this was the color photo, as you can see, and a classic uh, PED which had multiple peaks so it meant it was more of a pcv variant we did an angio which showed a small leak over there and the icg was shown which showed probably an hotspot beyond that and this patient initially was treated with multiple aflibercept injections but every time you treated the height of the ped would come down and then again it would bounce back in spite of use at q4 q6 intervals and this is when at nine months after five dosages of aflibercept which are given four to six weeks interval you can see it was as bad as that it had um, after five doses and you could see the orange issue which was po uh, spelt about being in converting into an hemorrhagic variant and this is the time when we introduced prolocizumab we had prolocizumab we went ahead with prolocizumab injection and this is within one month you can see the orange issue has moved to more organized the shape of the lesion also started organizing on the OCT also corresponding OCT you see the reduction in the height as well and that time we believed in injecting at 4 Q4 intervals as a loading dose and so you can see the subsequent follow-ups I will directly come to the timeline for uh, you these are the multiple injections this patient has received till we this disease went into remission so this is the timeline for you this is pre Prolocizumab after five aflibercept injections, and this is after for Q4, Q4, Q4. This is how you see the gradual reduction in the height of the PD and the subsequent resolution of the lesion. And this, once we achieved this particular remission, then it was finally over. Now I will show one representative case where we used in a bilateral cases of knife CNVMs. Now this is the picture at presentation of this 63 years old gentleman who had a bilateral CNVMs. This were nine cases and you can see the corresponding OCTs and the corresponding angios. And at this point we decided to inject brolocizumab as in in nine case as a primary molecule. So first it was injected in the right eye and two, two, uh, two days later we injected in the left eye by that time we had sufficient confidence in this molecule we did believe uh, started believing that this is the way we should be going ahead and you can see subsequently the follow-ups i would directly come to the timeline uh, because this is how we went ahead and kept on injecting as and when it was needed i will come to timeline just to show you this is what pre-injection 3 by 60 this is first injection second injection and you can see the duration of the injections kept on increasing and now this disease has gone into total remission and it's more than a 10 months that we don't have remission in this eye as well as in the left eye this is left eye this is how the disease started and this is within q4 q6 where we uh, we had a remission and then intermittently there was some activity which would come down which we would inject with brolocizumab so in general we totally gave in right eye probably 6 brolocizumab over q6 or q8 interval while in left eye treat uh, needed at q12 interval q10 to 12 interval and uh, after 3 to 4 injections this disease has gone into total remission so friends this is a molecule which is exciting and the most important thing is the the basic limitation which comes with the handicap of using it multiple times decreases the compliance on the part of a patient in spite of affordability this molecule gives you an option of having a more durable molecule and therefore number of injections per year are reduced thereby reducing not only the financial burden but it also gives you an option of having a less number of injections thank you Uh, sir, uh, that's what uh, what we get to the feedback is many of the times when we travel across. We see parallel sessions, uh, one hall, the other hall, they will be talking that uh, this should not be used and they should be cautioned in using. When brain study said there's no inflammation and your data also shares no inflammation, a lot of people say this. So where is the, where is the limitation? Sir, uh, that's what... Uh, the 
yeah everything that is the wonderful uh, molecule sir but whatever that initial search that merlin trial which came in which showed that it showed uh, uh, that is the fear which has been introduced into the minds of the common public that's what we would like people to understand that it is not as bad a molecule as it it definitely overscores the small amount of risk which probably we might be taking with this molecule now i have a experience of 400 plus injections with this molecule right from we have even started injecting in cases of vascular retinopathy is called central retinal vein occlusion diabetic macular edemas at least in resistant cases they do yeah exactly now the dme it has been approved sir it has been approved. yeah so uh, Sir, that's why the experience sharing would definitely increase the confidence in this molecule. At least in our center, we are so convinced that it has started replacing the anti of molecules like uh, Avastin. Because the we are placed in a country where socio-economic considerations make a I major know, role into play. The competition of is not with Avastin. Avastin competition comes with biosimilars. No, but even but at our center, it works out cheaper to them. If I have to inject three Avastins at the rate of 8,000 rupees, it costs almost 27,000, 28,000, while a prolosis with a procedure cost of 5,000 costs 29,000 in our center. Yeah. So, I agree with you. I agree with you. If you see the durability and the cost, yeah. you may score over it. Wonderful. Thank nice you, sir. Thank, thank. Nice to share, uh, you. Thank you. Nice to share this beautiful slide you have shown. Thank you, sir. Yeah, now it initially when we started. Loading tools with a molecule which has a 26 kilo Dalton weight and penetrates, you know, deeply into the chloride and the loading tools are responsible for inflammation. Yes, sir. In fact, this is one of the few cases when we, brolucizumab was just introduced in our country. So, I am still showing that particular case. Now, everyone does it on a treat and extend basis. Last question I will ask everybody is, have you ever regretted using it? Sir, yes, we have some certain regrets. The num we charge, see, the pr number of procedures, if they are reduced, naturally it decreases the income of a surgeon. sir. Finally, every one of us has to earn a bread for ourselves. Uh, Chaitra, have you regretted? No. Because I don't think so. I have ever regretted using this. Exactly. No. Thanks a Thank lot. You, Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, now let's move on to the interesting cases. Uh, I invite Dr. Pradipi Raj to talk about the docket funders. And as uh, she's uh, completing, we request the next speaker to be on stage. Uh, at least be ready.
vitreous detachment, macular edema, blunt trauma. This image shows posterior vitreous detachment. In this image, we can see an outer foveal micro defect. In figure B, we can see there is a blunt trauma. In figure C, there is a trauma due to a laser pointer. And figure E shows a photo trauma due to eclipse viewing. So I conclude here by saying that all the patients suffering from OMD could appear with a normal fundus. And the differential diagnosis include cone dystrophy, amblyopia, etc. Macular OCT and ERG are mandatory. We emphasize the importance of this differential diagnosis in these cases with no fundoscopic findings. Currently, no treatment is available for the patients with OMD and the visual acuity for most patients appears slowly worsen over a span of 10 to 20 years. However, there is a significant variability that exists between patients and larger and much longer term studies are needed to better counsel the patients on their individual prognosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, in a cross-sectional examination without having follow-up, how would you differentiate this from, uh, let's say, a solar so actually the patient didn't give any history of uh, solar or eclipse viewing and he was actually a construction worker so i was actually ruling out maybe he's working in a factory or something so there could be exposure of uh, welding or something but he was a construction worker and he was not exposed to anything like that so i ruled out photic retinopathy Is that a sir the father had a no such thing he came for an examination but uh, the vision was ap apparently normal and the fundoscopy was also normal uh, but he was uh, pretty unsure that maybe his grandfather had such disease. So maybe there's a hereditary connection. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you Thank you, sir. Uh, invite our next speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm presenting a guided atrophy of the choroid and retina. So a 15-year-old female presented to the eye clinic with chief complaints of progressive bilateral loss of vision and difficulty in seeing at night since last five years. Uh, the ocular examination, uh, the best corrected visual acuity in both eyes was 6 by 9, with a refractive error of minus 8.50 diopter spherical and minus 1 diopter cylinder at 180 degree. The slit lamp examination of anterior segment in both eye was unremarkable. The IOP was 14 millimeter of mercury column. Uh, uh, the, we come to ocular examination. In the right eye, as we can see, uh, there is a blunted foveal reflex. There are patchy, well-defined areas of chorioretinal atrophy in the peripheral fundus. And some lesions in the posterior pole, they have coalesced uh, around the inferior awkward vessels, like we can see in this image. In the left eye, a similar picture is shown. The, fo the fovea is hyperpigmented. There are patchy, well-defined areas of chorioretinal atrophy in the peripheral fundus. Again, in the posterior fold, we find a similar Im uh, image uh, as, we can uh, as we saw in the right eye uh, with uh, coalesced lesions around the inferior and superior awkward vessels. Uh, this is a uh, OCT image of the right eye. It shows splitting of the retinal layers at and around the fovea. There is extensive loss of photoreceptor layer with outer and inner retinal thinning in the areas of chorioretinal atrophy. So this, this is, there is a horizontal scan and a vertical scan, the similar picture. In the left eye, uh, we have a similar image with uh, uh, foveous schisis and retinal thinning. This is a OCT angiography image showing normal superficial and deep retinal capillary plexus and choriocapillaries layer in both the eyes. This is the RN full thickness pattern, which is more or less normal in this patient. Uh, we did a 30 2 perimetry in my patient, uh, which shows uh, significantly, significantly depressed fields involving the fixation. A 10 2 image was also done, which, invol which shows involvement of the central fields. So, uh, the differential diagnosis in my case is uh, it's choroideremia, retinitis pigmentosa congenital stationary night blindness, myopic degeneration, cobblestone degeneration, diffuse choriocapillaries atrophy, and multifocal choroiditis. 
The provisional diagnosis is based on history, clinical examination, and multimodal imaging. It was bilateral gyrate atrophy with foveous schizis. So, gyrate atrophy of the choroid retina is mainly an autosomal recessive dystrophy. It is caused by the deficiency in the enzyme OAT, which is ornithine aminotransferase, resulting in the increased plasma ornithine con concentrations. Patient usually presents with night blindness followed by visual field constriction and eventually diminution of central vision and blindness. The ERG abnormalities are presented early with impaired rod and cones responses and it is largely a clinical diagnosis based on history and examination. The complications like in our patients we saw foveal schizis, other complications could include CME, foveal thinning. Uh, the vitreoretinal complications includes vitreous hemorrhage, intraocular lens dislocation. Neurological complications may include mental retardation and speech defects. Uh, none was seen in our patients, uh, only um, we saw macular complications. The conclusion is because this con condition is inherited, so a screening is must in the siblings. Visual field testing is uh, um, mandatory, which shows loss of uh, uh, progressive visual field const constriction. The treatment mainly consists of dietary modifications, which helps lower the elevated systemic ornithine levels. And the restriction of arginine in the diet is also a, a mode of treatment. Some patients can uh, have been seen to benefit from vitamin B6 supplementation, which acts as a coenzyme for the uh, oat enzyme, a, a cofactor for the oat enzyme. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so in my patient, as we saw, uh, the posterior pole was involved. So uh, there was thinning around the uh, area involving the posterior pole. Along with that, foveous schizis was there, which I think is the reason for uh, the central loss of vision in this patient. So uh, the visual visual acuity was six nine, uh, best corrected visual acuity. Yes, but uh, as we can see, the, the patient is unaware that she has a, a such, such uh, I mean dif diminished. Uh, v uh, depressed v uh, visual field along with uh, loss of central vision also. So she is unaware of that. So when we uh, did a refractive correction, she was uh, giving a six, 6 by 9 vision. So maybe some part of the central field was there through which she could see. So usually congenital X-linked cases ends up with foveal atrophy and poorer vision. Yeah. But in your case of gyrated atrophy, foveal is the secondary complication, they end up having preserved. Yeah, so yeah, yes sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So, uh, do we have Dr. Mudra here? Yes. Uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar Rai. And uh, Dr. Pratya. Over here. So, Dr. Vinay will be speaking on a rare case of bilateral multifocal CSCR with uh, bilateral bullous exudative retinal detachment. Good evening everyone. Today I am presenting a case of a rare case of bilateral multifocal C CSR with bilateral bullous exudative retinal detachment. Central serous chorioretinopathy is a idiopathic retinal disorder characterized by local serous detachment of neurosensory retina and focal serous pigment epithelium detachment within the posterior pole. CSR is typically unilateral, affects young or middle aged male with risk factor including type A personality, high stress high lifestyle, high level storage and obstructive sleep apnea. Multifocal CSR is characterized by multiple focal leaks. Bullous CSR on the other hand is a rare atypical presentation characterized by bullous exudative retinal detachment which especially involves inferior quadrant. A 40 year female patient presented with complaint of painless gradually progressive diminution of vision in both eyes since 8 months. She has completed her family. Both best corrective vision in right eye is 6 by 36 and in left eye it is 6 by 24. Sit lamp examination, intraocular pressure, ocular motor, motility were unremarkable. This is the fundus photo of the right eye which shows the multiple subretinal yellowish lesion with pockets of subretinal fluids and bullous retinal detachment in inferior fundus which is more in the right eye in compare of the left eye. Subretinal fibrosis are present in right eye temporal and inferior to the fovea and in the left eye infronasal to the disc. This is the OCT photo of the right eye and left eye. OCT shows inner and outer retinal folds, sub, uh, subretinal fluid involving, involving fovea in both eye. Right eye also shows serous uh, pigment epithelial detachment. 
subretinal fibrin membrane and subretinal scarring fundus fluorescent angiography this is the fundus photo uh, 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 this is the fluorescent angiography of the right eye we show the different stages of the fluorescent angiography we can see the mul multiple pinpoint pinpoint hyperfluorescence in the early assess early stage which correspond to the air area of multiple leakage and block fluorescence is present block fluorescence is present corresponding to the area of a subretinal fibrosis and in the and hyperfluorescent area is present in the inferior fundus so same is the in the case of the fundus photo of the left eye you can see the multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence with blocked hyperfluorescence corresponding to the area of subretinal fibrosis and we can see the there is the late stage you can see the pooling is also present discussion a provisional diagnosis of bilateral multifocal csr with bilateral bullous exudative retinal detachment was made csr uh, i already mentioned that there, there is a risk factor of this csr however, however multifo multifocal bullous csr is a rare and atypical form of csr which has more bilateral predilection compared to the typical csr in my case csr is bilateral patient is young female with no history of steroid intake Pathogenesis of bullous CSR is not fully understood, however, it is postulated that choroidal vessel hyperpermeability allows fluid accumulation into the choroid, which causes RPE decomposition followed by PAD and leakage of fibrin in subretinal space, causing a retinal tear and exudative retinal detachment. Accurate diagnosis of bullous CSR is very important to discuss it from the other pathologies such as EVL fusion, metastatic carcinoma or lymphoma, multifocal choroiditis, sympathetic ophthalmia, Harada disease to avoid unnecessary in investigation, inappropriate corticosteroid treatment, which may further increase severity of the disease or could hamper long term visual outcome. Treatment of multifocal bullous CSR is challenging due to its chronicity and multiple leakage sites. Efficacy of treatment or long term visual outcome depends on the time of diagnosis. Multiple treatment options exist to treat CSR. In my patient, focal laser was avoided in view of multiple leakage spores in both eyes. Micropost laser and PDT was not available at our center. Therefore, patient was started on oral epilipone 25 mg per day and planned for anti vasodilatory injection in right eye. She was also concerned regarding surgery for subretinal fluid drainage in case of no significant res resolution of bullous RD. Conclusion To conclude, multifocal bullous CSR is a rare manifestation of CSR with chronic course of illness. Early diagnosis and intervention is necessary for maximum visual improvement and to prevent subretinal fibrosis. These are my re references. Thank you. Uh, somehow this doesn't look like CSR to me. The OCT image, if you can go back to the OCT image, doesn't look like CSR. And uh, even the fundus fluorescent angiography, I, I think you need to revise your diagnosis. And your fundus image also doesn't show the typical exudative kind of uh, detachment. Sir, uh, these are, uh, you can see the in, uh, lower vessels are not prominent in inferior fundus. No, no, if you want to show multifocal leaks, you have to show in the same fundus image the early phase, the mid phase, and the late phase. Your images are uh, you know, shown somewhere in the nasal field, somewhere in the posterior pole. There are no early phases. So, uh, I think you need to revise your diagnosis. At least, uh, and if you see the OCT image, in CSCR you will never get intraretinal edema. You have intraretinal edema, spongy edema. Sir, this PD is, is present, sir. No, no, this is not CSR, that's what I'm saying. You have to revise your diagnosis. And uh, what, how did the patient respond to the treatment? Sir, we lost the patient in follow-up, sir. She so went to other centers. Yeah, so, uh, since you don't have the, you know, the treatment, whatever you gave to the patient probably didn't work and she went elsewhere. Yeah, yeah I think it's uh, maybe some, uh, some implementary pathology will be added. Sir, there, the, uh, so there is no sign of uh, VITs, any and any posterior yeah, batteries or anterior batteries? Yeah, it's not present in the And uh, you know, uh, uh, in Indian uh, subcontinent, Hada disease is present as a separate disease. We don't yes. have uh, other systemic and skin manifestations also, most of the patients. So uh, maybe a trial of steroids can be given after the diagnosis is done. After the rule of all the other antibiotic process. But she would have responded to uh, oral steroids. 
at least this case. So whenever you present any case, uh, and if you want to confirm the diagnosis, yes, sir. you should, uh, uh, I mean, talk to your seniors or something. Sir, we have talked to the uh, senior sir, uh, no, re on retainer surgeon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, inviting next Dr. Pragya Prasu, who will talk about uh, unilateral myelinated nerve fiber with anisometropic amblyopia, a report of two cases. And uh, as uh, Dr. Mutra come, in that case, after Dr. Pragya, will be our final speaker, Dr. Samya Shashi. Is she there? Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Pragya Prasun. And uh, today I am presenting a, a case of unilateral extensive myelinated nerve fibers associated with anisometropic amblyopia and visual field loss, a report of two cases. Purpose of presentation is to report two cases of unilateral extensive myelinated nerve fibers with uh, associated anisometropic amblyopia with visual field loss. My first case was a 14-year-old girl who referred to us for low vision in her right eye since childhood. She had normal developmental milestones and there is no history of any systemic illness. Best corrected visual acuity was 20 by 500 and 20 by 20 in right and left eyes respectively. A refractive error of minus 15 diopter spherical was noted in the right eye while the left eye was amyotropic. Entire segment by micro microscopic examination was normal. On fundus photography, uh, the fundus photograph of right eye and left eye showing extensive peripapillary myelinated nerve fibers in the right eye with macular involvement and the unremarkable fundus in the left eye. On OCT, <coughs> sorry, OCT passing through the posterior pole showing hyperreflectivity corresponding to the myelinated nerve fiber layer with its dis indistinguishable inner retinal layer. The outer retinal layers appears thinned out with back showing from the overlying hyperreflective myelinated layers. There was a posterior staphylomatous de deformity noted on OCT inferior to fovea. Uh, there was a HBF 24-2 was done which revealed scotoma in the superior more scotoma in the superior more than the inferior fields corresponding to the location and the density of myelinated nerve fiber seen clinically. There was amblyopia therapy was initiated and guarded visual prognosis was explained in view of severe involvement of macular fibers. My case, case, second case was a 23-year-old male presented with complaint of diminished vision in left eye for 15 years. His unaided visual acuity in right eye was 20 by 20 and left eye was counting finger 2 meter. Entire segment examination in both eye was unremarkable. On posterior segment examination, the right eye fundus examination showed clear media with medium sized optic disc of 0.3 is to 1 with vertical cup to disc ratio and normal caliber of blood vessels. On left eye, there is a presence of chalky white, chalky white myelinated nerve fiber from the disc involving the posterior pole, sparing the fovea and extending to nasal arcade and superior part of the retina just and posterior to mid periphery. On OCT, uh, it shows the thickened nerve fiber layer uh, with the presence of <coughs> sorry, presence of hyperreflectivity involving the inner plexiform layer. Rest of the retinal layers could not be made out owing to the back shadowing. Axial length of right eye and left eye was 24.48 mm and 27.97 mm respectively. On retinoscopy of left eye, there is a vertical reading was minus 7 diopter and horizontal reading was minus 3 diopter cylindrical at 170 degree. Patient visions improved to 20 by 160 with minus 7 diopter spare and 1.5 diopter of cylinder at 180 degree. The diagnosis was made as left eye anisometropic amblyopia with increased axial length secondary to myelinated nerve fiber. Patient preferred the use of contact lens with the prescribed refractive correction. Uh, our differential diagnosis was active retinitis. Posterior po uh, as a posterior pole yellowish white lesion can be misdiagnosed as an active retinitis patch, but it can be differentiated by a long duration of symptoms and non-progressive nature of vision loss. 
would help in differentiating it from the more indolent myelinated nerve fibers. Treatment was that there is no treatment available for myelinated nerve fibers causing visual loss. Only supportive care with amlipia therapy was advised. A guided visual prognosis was explained and the patient was advised a routine annual checkup for follow-up. In discussion, there is a myelination of optic nerve fibers typically terminates at the lamina cribrosa. There is a hypothesis of local blood-brain barrier controlling passage of the various substances. By this way, myelination is seen around the axon but cannot pass lamina cribrosa. Myelinated nerve fibers are present in some animal in the nature, especially the rabbit who do not have lamina cribrosa and cannot show barrier function. <coughs> Myelinated nerve fibers typically do not always cause visual problems unless extensive and can be diagnosed incidentally. Learning point, our learning points were. Yes, this is last slide. Sir. Myelinated nerve fibers are commonly present in the peripapillary area with varying degree of severity and visual affection. Extensive myelinated nerve fiber can be associated with ipsilateral hyomyopia, associated with amblyopia and visual field loss. Early diagnosis of this condition and prompt amblyopia therapy could lead to good visual results. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you know what extent of myelinated nerve fibers actually end up causing an asymmetric? Because uh, few of them, uh, most of them sometimes don't. Yes, sir. Sometimes it, yes, sir. Sometimes it doesn't cause um, amblyopia, sir. Uh, in cases there is extensive myelination and involves the foveal region and um, uh, 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 disc area it involves and it causes sir. Yeah. So what do you think this uh, anisometropia is the reason uh, for the poor uh, visual uh, acuity or is it the myelination that is causing Sir, myelination problem? causes an uh, amblyopia sir, there is a loss of nerve fibers and involving of ma macular area, sir, and that due to myelination, there is a loss of vision, sir. Thank you. I think, uh, in my knowledge, there is no such association of myelinated nerve fibers and myopia, but more common in myopia. Yes, sir. It causes myopia also, sir. So, I mean, that, that is what I was trying to ask, whether the myelinated nerve fiber is responsible for the ipsilateral myopia or is it just an incidental finding in your two cases? Sir, it was just an incidental finding, sir. So, it was not the myelinated nerve fibers no, which was the it was for no, the sir. poor vision, it was yes, sir. the Patient came with just poor vision and it was incidental finding on fundus examination, sir. It is not the see your topic is your topic is uh, unilateral myelinated nerve fiber with anisometropic amblyopia. So the uh, myelinated nerve fiber is not causing the no sir. Uh, poor it's caused myopia and uh, staphyloma, posterior staphyloma, and that leads to. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sir. Uh, and the last speaker we have is Dr. Swamya Shashi. And he'll be talking on uh, Wardenberg syndrome, parietal hypopigmentation with congenital toxoplasmosis scar in the fellow. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I am presenting a case of Wardenberg syndrome, a rare presentation of unilateral choroidal hypopigmentation and congenital toxoplasmosis scar in the fellow eye. So firstly, I would like to introduce about this Wardenberg syndrome. Th this is a genetic disorder which is inherited in autosominant dominant fashion. Its clinical features include hearing loss, changes in the color of hair, skin and eyes. Although the hearing loss uh, is variable, ranging from moderate to profound, profound. Uh, types. There are four types of uh, Wardenberg syndrome. These types are based on whether the which gene is involved and also the classif uh, on the on the clinical features, namely type one, two, three, and four. 
So coming to our case, a 17 year old boy from Purnia presented to the OPD with chief complaints of diminution of vision in the right eye since childhood. His best corrected visual acuity was 20 by 400 and 24 and 20 by 20 and 6 in the right and left eye respectively. History of presenting illness. He developed diminution of vision since childhood in the right eye, which was non-progressive in nature, not associated with pain, watering, redness and floaters. Also, there was no refractive error in either of the eyes. Past history was un insignificant. Family history was also insignificant. Gener coming to the general physical examination, the positive findings were white forelock, presence of broad nasal root and mild laxicity with straightening of joints and also there was no evidence of any skin uh, depigmentation or hearing abnormality. Coming to the ocular examination, all the parameters were normal. The positive findings here are presence of sinophrys and uh, telecanthus and uh, in the left eye there was heterochromia iridium. Other parameters were within normal limits. So picture A uh, represents sinophrys or the unibro. Picture B shows the white forelock. C and D are the pictures of right and left eye showing the heterochromia iridium in the left eye. So coming to the fundus findings, picture A is the fundus photo of the lef left eye. This is uh, showing hypopigmentation in the nasal half of the retina and its uh, corresponding OCT is showing, the corresponding line OCT is showing thinning of the choroid in the uh, corresponding hypopigmented area. Picture B is the photograph of fundus photograph of right eye showing a rough roughly two disc diameter uh, large scar in the uh, temporal to the f uh, disc and also there is a uh, uh, excavation in the OCT scene with uh, along with thinning of the choroid. So I come to a provisional diagnosis of Wardenberg syndrome type 1 with unilateral choroidal hypopigmentation and with congenital congenital toxoplasmosis scar. It is a clinical diagnosis, but there are two criteria used for diagnosis. They are the, that are the major criteria and the minor criteria. Major criteria are heterochromia, sensorineural deafness, white forelock, lateral displacement of the inner canthi of the eyes, and a first degree relative with the Wardenburg syndrome. Minor criteria are broad nasal root, white macules or patches on the skin, sinophrys, premature graying of the scalp hairs, and hypoplasia of the nasal eye. And for cl clinical diagnosis of type 1 Wardenburg syndrome, two major or one minor and two minor criteria are needed. So my differential diagnosis are pibaldism and teeth syndrome. Management, since it has no uh, as a management as such, there is no definitive treatment. Uh, the we uh, genetic counseling is usually done. Coming to the discussion. This is a rare case of Wardenburg syndrome with unilateral sectoral hypopigmentation and a congenital taxoplasma scar in the fellow eye. Our case demonstrated unilateral sectoral choroidal hypopigmentation in the nasal of the eye, while the right, right eye did not show any hypopigmentary changes. An abnormal choroidal thickness probably suggests structural defect in the hypopigmented choroid with reduced stromal thickness. An intriguing finding was presence of healed macular toxoplasmosis uh, retinochoroiditis lesion with no choroidal pigmentary changes in the fellow eye. The resolved choroiditis lesions were noted only in the areas of normally thickened choroid which could suggest the propensity of the infection in a more vascularized area. So I conclude the presence of toxoplasma scar along with choroidal hypopigmentation makes this case unique. The presence of these two clinically different pathologies probably represents a coincidental association. Though Wardenburg syndrome is a rare syndrome, large pooled sample of may provide more insight on Wardenburg syndrome, its various associations and structural and vascular changes in the retina and choroid. These are my references. Thank you.